Welcome to North Park Stratford. My name is Kirk Earhart. I'm the site pastor, and we are so excited that you chose to join us uh, for online church this weekend. And we hope that you just had an amazing week, right? Uh, we just hope that God has been moving in you and encouraging you and challenging you. You know, the scriptures in the Psalms in 100 says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. And in a few minutes, that's what we're going to do as we respond to the good news of God's love for you and for me. Well, a few announcements I want to make known to you before we get started. And the first one is this, is uh, we're really excited about some of the upcoming stuff uh, that we have uh, at North Park Stratford. Uh, the first one is next week marks the one year anniversary since we started our very, very first church service. We couldn't even get in our building at that point. Uh, we could just use a washroom and it didn't even have a sink. Uh, but we met in the backyard. And so I thought what we would do for next week is we would do a year in review. It has been a crazy year to start this church, North Park Stratford. Uh, we were six months in and then we had to shut down in-person services for uh, COVID and uh, we're still in that place. But I think God's been doing something amazing in here. So I want to encourage you to next week join us as we celebrate a year of faithfulness in what God's been doing. After that, we're going to do a new teaching series that is called Selfless. You know, the Bible talks extensively about how we're supposed to be others-oriented. We're supposed to bless one another, supposed to serve one another, supposed to love one another. So we're going to take the month of August and we're going to study those one another's together through the scriptures. So we invite you to tune in and maybe even invite a friend. As always, check us out online at our Facebook page. Uh, you know, uh, you can look, search up North Park Stratford, and we'd love to have you check out that, as well as Instagram. Uh, we're on Instagram, and check us on our website at northpark.ca. And actually, on the main North Park page, there's some great resources for you. I just wanted to draw your attention to. Because we've got some midweek stuff just to help you. We've got some mental health insights from Trish Hack, our director or our pastor of uh, care uh, with our Fanshawe location. We've got some parenting moments with Matt Loveday, who is a family life pastor at Fanshawe, as well as our, some marriage moments with Pastor Paul McIlwraith and his wife, Carolyn. These are just great resources I want to turn your attention to. And speaking of resources, we want to try to do something though. We know we can't gather for worship together yet. Uh, we can't do that in a way that will protect you and keep you safe. And we love you too much to try to force it. But what we can do is start to figure out a few smaller things. So what I want to do is for the month of August, starting on August 4th, is I want to do a midweek teaching series. Now, we're actually going to be able to offer that in our church. We're going to have tables that will be socially distanced apart. We would ask you to wear a mask and we'll roll out some more details coming up soon. But we will do an evening Bible study and we're going to walk through the book of Ephesians. I've been preparing it uh, this week and I'm excited to walk in that journey with you. And so we hope that you will come and join us for that. That'll be on site. But for those who don't want to do it on site, we're also going to make it available online. We're going to do a pre-recorded video that you can watch and then the booklet you'll be able to download and work through the questions as well. Because we want to help you know Jesus better in the scriptures and in the Bible. And so we're excited to be able to do that. Well, I think that's about it for announcements and stuff. And I think now it's time to do what the Bible says and to worship the Lord God. So we're going to move into some, sing into some singing. And hey, let's do church. I worship you, I worship you, you are here and you're working in this place, I worship you, I 
worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, and you're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, and you're touching it every heart. I worship you. Lord, I worship you. You are here, healing in every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, and you turn the lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You. you are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are we make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you stop never stop working you never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working you never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop Never stop working, you never stop, never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, never stop working, you never stop, never stop working, when you make a miracle work, a promise keep a Who you are. 
We make a miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're the fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, and purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, and purified, you take whatever you desire. Oh, Lord, is my life. If your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You'll refine. The refiner, I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life, I want to be tried by fire, and And clean my hands, purify my heart, cause I wanna burn for you, only for you, and take my life as a sacrifice, cause I wanna burn for you. Purify my heart. I want to burn for you. Only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you. Only for you. And clean. I want to be consumed. You're the fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried.
everyone. I am um, really excited to share today. I was listening to a podcast this week and they shared a quote by a guy named John Dewey. And it said, we do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. And I have to say that this week, well, it was more than a week, spending some time kind of reflecting on my life has really been an honor. It's been really enriching to kind of look back and really cathartic to, to get to kind of look back on my life and, and not just think about the ways that God has been at work in my life, but the ways that um, his amazing work can be shown. So today is about my story. And um, let me just start by telling you a little bit about myself. We are grew up in a Christian family. We were immigrants. My parents immigrated to Canada um, a couple years before I was born. So we started in Mississauga. Um, they started in South Africa. They came to Canada um, to get a fresh start. South Africa is a pretty dangerous place. It's amazing and beautiful, but it's, um, it's a hard place to live in. And so we started in Mississauga and we ended up moving to a farm outside of Ingersoll. And that's where I stayed until I got married um, many years later, obviously. Uh, I am the youngest of three kids. Uh, I've got an older brother named Andre. He's about 12 years old, older than myself, and he still lives in South Africa. I have an older sister. She's about five years older than me, and she lives in Ontario here. And uh, so I am the youngest, but I would say that uh, I kind of had the youngest sibling experience, but in a way I sort of had an only child experience too, because from about 14 years old and on, I was kind of on my own. I kind of got all the attention from my parents, which maybe wasn't great, but <laughs> that's what happened. Um, you know, being newcomers to Canada, it was tough financially. Uh, we, it was tight financially a lot of the times, but you know, like, I don't remember that being the focus of our childhood. Like, if you were to ask me um, what I remembered, I remembered that we were a happy family. It was it was happy, even though it was definitely hard. My dad got laid off a lot, and uh, I think my parents did a good job kind of keeping lots of joy in our lives despite the, um, the hard times, for sure. So I would say that my faith story really started before I was born, which I know is really cliche, but I do. I really feel like my faith star story starts with my parents. Because growing up in South Africa, my mom was raised Catholic, you know, all girls Catholic school. Um, my dad was in an Anglican church where, uh, you know, he, he shares this story about how Sunday morning for him was getting dressed up in your nicest clothes and here's your offering money, Roy, and then sending him off out the door to walk down to church by himself. I'm sure you can imagine that many times he did not end up at church. Um, yeah, he, uh, he told a lot of stories about taking his offering money and going down to the store. And you know what? That's just what was modeled for them. So I would say that my parents' faith experience was more religious and habitual than it was, in fact, anything to do with Jesus. Um, yeah, so... After they got married, um, they lived in a little apartment building. Um, they did not go to church. I don't know if they would call themselves Christians even, but uh, there was this guy named Glenn. He lived in the apartment building. He lived upstairs, and they were good friends. Uh, every Sunday morning, he would come down, knock on their door, and say, You ready to go to church? And um, it was a big joke between all of them. And every week my parents would say, nope, nope, not this week, not this week. And uh, it was a big joke between them, but it was actually kind of funny because my parents thought, how funny would it be if um, he came down and knocked on the door and said, you ready to church, ready to go to church? And, and they said, yeah, yeah, we're ready to go. So they got ready. 
Glenn comes down Sunday morning, knocks on the door, opens the door. You ready to go to church? My parents walk out. They're like, yep, let's go. They thought, what a big joke it would be. And then, so they went to church. And then they started going to church regularly. And then they committed their lives to Jesus. And they were baptized when my sister was just a baby. And uh, I love that. I love that the joke was on them, you know, that they thought, how funny would it be if we went to church? But then <laughs> their lives were completely changed in doing so. Um, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful to Glenn. I'm grateful that he knocked on that door every single Sunday and he did not give up on my parents. Yeah, like I'm so grateful for that. So so my parents were new believers and, um, you know, trying to figure out a new way of living with Jesus in your daily life that was not modeled for them. Uh, my mom would probably, I know she shared a lot of regret on our upbringing, like maybe wanting to do things differently, but isn't that like all of us, we look back and we think how we could do things differently. Um, you know, I'm reminded often when I think of this is just how we're only able to, to use the tools that are in our toolbox, you know, only able to work with what we're given. And you know, in life we move forward, we sometimes sidestep, we sometimes stall, but we keep moving forward. We keep moving forward of what we've got. And you know, I think about the, the next generation and you know, being probably because I'm a parent, I... I think about how we as parents are trying to just model how to live for our kids and, and it just always seems to come back to the vulnerability and how when we're vulnerable and we teach God, our kids, sorry, to lean into God, that that's really the best thing that we can teach them. We don't have to teach them exactly how to be, exactly what decisions to make. We teach them how to lean on God, how to be vulnerable. And my parents did that for me during hard times and uh, happy times too. You know, we don't have to pretend to be perfect because none of, it, none of us are really. So in a big way, I would say that my faith story definitely started with someone else's decision. And you know, Psalm 102, verse 18 says, Let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created, not yet created, praise the Lord. And I, uh, I spend some time thinking about this, that, you know, my decisions in my life, in my daily life, might affect hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people beyond myself in future generations. Me as a teenager. <laughs> well, some words that have been used to describe me in my adolescence have been stubborn, strong-willed, overly sensitive, <laughs> boy crazy, um, unfocused, social, sneaky. Did I say boy crazy? You know, of course I shared all the, the negative words. I'm sure there were some positive ones in there too, but those are the ones that stick with us, aren't they? The negative words, but um, probably in the grand scheme of things, I was somewhere in the middle. I was neither good nor bad. I was just an average teen who probably made some good decisions, but probably made, well, no, I know I did. I made some bad decisions. Um, I'm grateful that uh, I never did try any drugs. I never did sleep around. Um, I probably pushed things to its limit, but um, I did still steal cigarettes. From my father, before he quit smoking, um, I did come home drunk on a couple of occasions. Um, how did I feel as a teenager? Uh, some words I put to that might be insecure, stupid, I felt ugly. 
I felt unloved. I felt unlovable. And I, and I felt unqualified. I feel like as a teenager, I kind of bounced around between two worlds. I had this world at church where, um, sorry, and I should say like those two worlds, I feel like I, I never really fully fit into either of those worlds. So at church in our youth group, um, it was a great place. We had lots of fun, but all my youth group friends were, um, they attended all the same Christian school. So it was sort of like them and then me. And I kind of always felt like the bad kid from the public school. And so I, I never really felt like I was in with that group. Um, and then when I would go to school, um, I struggled with how to be a Christian in the school system that I was in. And to be honest, it was probably easier for me to just leave my faith at the door uh, on my way in. And so I did, um, I did often. Um, yeah, even though I would say though that my faith was deeply rooted at my core. And I am so grateful for that because um, I always return to that, which is so great. So when I was about 14, we, our youth group, got to go on a serve trip. It's serve is like a mission trip for teens. It's run by Youth Unlimited. It's still running all these many, many years later. I won't tell you how many years later, but. Um, so on the mission trip, we get to do things like help the less fortunate. We serve meals. We work with children. You work with elderly. You fix things. You build things. It's sort of a variety of tasks where we get to learn how to give of ourselves. So how to be selfless. And so that was a week that was really life-changing for me. Our group decided to go to Niagara Falls for our first year, our first serve trip. <clears throat> we slept on the floor of a school in the area. I don't think I could do that anymore. It was just like a sleeping bag on the floor. <laughs> Uh, we showered under a cold hose that was sort of slung over a branch of a tree. Again, I'm not sure I could do that <laughs> anymore. But we made it through and somehow it still managed to be a transformational year for me. Oh, sorry, a week for me. At the end of the week, there was kind of like this final worship service where uh, we all went um, there was a great message, lots of great music, and I remember the song Refiner's Fire playing. For those of you who've been in the faith for many years, you'll remember Refiner's Fire. It's all, all about kind of how God refines us and, and um, just rubs down those rough edges and makes us perfect, and it's wonderful. And so that song was playing. And I really was starting to feel stirred to change. I was feeling the Holy Spirit kind of prompting me to commit my life to Jesus, to commit my life to Him. And I, I felt like it was time for me to stop sitting on the fence. I needed to choose one side or the other. Who was I, right? So they, so they invited people to come up. If you, if you felt like you wanted to change, if you felt this like stirring within you and, uh, they call it an altar call. And I, I did, I answered an altar call that night at 14 and I went up and I asked for forgiveness for all of my failures. And I chose I chose a life going forward with Jesus as my savior. And I was changed. I was changed forever. Whew. Jesus saved me, just like he saved my parents all those years before. Oh, I'm so grateful. So my mom remembers um, coming to pick me up. She tells a story about how when she, she came to pick me up from that trip, I like... I remember seeing my parents, I jumped out of the van and I just ran to them. And uh, I was like overwhelmed with tears and I, I couldn't speak. I couldn't explain what had happened. I couldn't yet put into words this 
big thing that had happened to me that week. But she says that, you know, she, well, she said they both said um, they could tell that I was changed. Like I was different. At the end of high school, uh, I definitely would have said I felt a call to pastor or to go into ministry. Uh, I felt like I needed to go to Bible college, but I didn't really tell anybody. Um, I didn't really have a clear picture of what that was, what I wanted to take. There was, you know, in the end, uh, there was a variety of reasons why I didn't, I didn't go. You know, one of them being that the counselors at our public school didn't really have a good knowledge about what um, what was available in terms of Christian education. Uh, I was feeling unqualified to attend a university. Um, those feelings of inadequacy really creep up often. And, you know, I probably needed somebody to just speak some words of encouragement into me and to pray about it pray about the decision with me, but that didn't happen. And so, you know what? I ended up taking a two-year program at Fanshawe College in London for photography. And that led to a almost an almost 15-year career as a professional portrait photographer. Uh, I met hundreds of people, some difficult, some wonderful. Um, Definitely had some ups and downs in that and um, really took me down a hard road, if I'm completely honest with you. I stayed home during college and um, that's when I met my husband, Eric. We met at Taekwondo. We were blue belts at the time and for the record, I was a higher belt than him when we met. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we are now third degree black belts. We've continued on with Tech Window all these years later. And um, yeah, so we were married in 2004. Neither Eric nor myself were baptized uh, as teens or young adults. So we decided that we would get baptized together, which was kind of neat. Um, I came from a church that practiced infant baptism. So nobody suggested getting baptized as a teen to me. And I always kind of had it in the back of my mind, like maybe I should do this. And uh, Eric, he came from a system, like a church system where you kind of go through Sunday school and then you graduate into the baptism class and then you kind of baptize, get baptized. And he didn't want it to be something he did just because everyone else did. So he also wasn't baptized. So we as young adults got to be baptized together, um, which was really, really a cool experience. Added a whole new dimension to um, our marriage and really to baptism as well. We have three kids together all these years later. Uh, Gavin, Natalie, and Fiona. They are truly amazing and truly humbling at many times. Yeah. So the bulk of my adulthood, I spent feeling like there was more for me. I found my photography business draining. It was unfulfilling. Customers were demanding and I was stressed out. Um, I was miserable. And to be honest, I've spent a lot of time since then apologizing to people who I hurt during that time. And, you know, I think I felt God working something out for me, but I had to wait. You know, that waiting that we often have to do. I was there. Since I was about 21 years old, I've struggled on and off with depression um, sometimes it's just like a low grade blue feeling, but it's always there. And, um, probably that would surprise a lot of people. Um, they would have no idea. That's probably because I'm a bit of a chameleon. Um, I'm not super proud of that, but I'm really good at masks 
um, if you are familiar with that personality scale called the Enneagram, um, this might help you understand. I am a three. So threes are great at being who the room needs them to be. Um, they are also really out of touch with themselves emotionally. They don't necessarily know how to name how they're feeling. Uh, several years ago, a friend of mine introduced me to the Enneagram. And as I dove deeper into it, I was both fascinated and horrified all at the same time. Uh, all those deep, dark things that you think were right there on the page. And I felt like I needed to cover them up, cover up the words, because I didn't want people to know that I was thinking those things. It's awful. Um, but I did. I dove deeper. And to be honest, it sort of sent me into a bit of an identity crisis. Sounds really cliche, but that is what I would call it. Because of how I understood the world, um, I had spent my whole life doing things that pleased other people. So if somebody gave me praise in an area, I might sway that direction. Um, but that also means that I had spent my whole life not really knowing what I liked, what I wanted to do. More importantly, what God wanted for me. Um, so for a while there, I was kind of evaluating every single thing in my life. Why did I make this choice? Why am I doing this? Current decisions too. Um, it really wrecked me. It wrecked me for a while, to be honest. Um, I questioned everything. I still do question everything, but I do it in more of a healthy way now. Um, as some of you know, vulnerability is kind of that key to so many doors. And being able to be vulnerable through the Enneagram allowed me to fight through and to come to a new place of identity in Christ, a new place. I knew I was a Christ follower before, but this was different. This was like I knew myself better now. I knew myself in the way that God already did know me. And that allowed me to make better decisions in my life. Um, it brought me that much more joy and satisfaction and clarity than ever before. Because it just kind of realigned me with Jesus. Huh. I got that feeling that God had something bigger in mind for me. And it returned in like full force like it had once before. But he told me to wait. I got that sense that I needed to wait again. And waiting is so hard. I know you do know. Uh, but what often happens is when we're waiting, doubt sets in. You start doubting yourself. And I watched as so many of my Christian friends kind of had their, their prayers answered in these big, amazing ways. And it's so great to see that. But if I'm really honest, I would say that I would sometimes go home and have that feeling of, it sounds so childish, but when me, God, when is it my turn? And the truth is in looking back, I'm not sure I ever really clearly and directly asked God for more. I was probably scared to do that. It's a little bit scary when you ask God to really look deeply at yourself and really give you more. Uh, maybe I was scared to give up control. Maybe I think a big part of it was I was a little bit scared to look like a fool walking into stuff that I am unqualified for, according to the world's standards. So in the summer of 2019, um, I got the opportunity to go up and serve for a month at a kid's camp called Camp Kakwa. It's up north, about four hours north of where I live. Um, it was great. It was for the whole month of July. Um, it was hectic and crazy as kids camps tend to be, but it was also really great at the same time. Um, I had never been away from my kids that long 
And July tends to be a really hectic work month for my husband. And um, <laughs> my kids wanted to go to Conestoga Bible for a couple of weeks. He would have to be in charge of like running them to and from, from camp and all the coordinating. And then did I mention we got a puppy? Yeah, it was a crazy time. And to be honest, I wanted to back out. I wanted to back out of going to camp. Um, but he talked me back into it a lot of times. And I'm so glad because I was able to go up there and serve for four weeks. And it was a blessing. It was a break from reality. I would say that I needed sometimes reality felt a bit like a tornado. Um, I was able to have a lot of time to pray and more importantly, listen while I was at camp. Um, just some of that like freight train sound of life that was distracting me from hearing God was sort of gone while I was at camp. And, um, and I really listened and I spent so much time really clearly asking God for directions and listening for a response. And I would say that I got the sense that God would, would respond when I made some space in my life for something new. So while I was at camp, I made the commitment to close my photography business with finality, like very clearly closed when I got home. And I needed to stop holding on to the old and make way for the new. That's what I felt like. And so on the last two Sundays of camp, um, the first Sunday, I kind of felt a call. I felt two calls while I was there. The first one, I felt a call to pastoring. And I was immediately flooded with all those feelings of inadequacy that um, I was all too familiar with. And I was, I was a little bit embarrassed to tell people about this too, because I felt like I was going to have to face other people's doubts in me too. Uh, yeah, it was rough. Then the second time, the second week, I felt that Eric and I were being called to start a new church. Um, I, thought, I sort of said to God, okay, but um, can you tell Eric? Because I don't want to. I wish this was one of those stories that, you know, God laid it on both of our hearts. We came together and we're like, oh, you had the same feeling. This is not that story. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, n nothing against my husband by any means. It just was not that story. Um, it, it was, there was a lot of mixed understanding about, about that and <laughs> it maybe led to some fights, to be honest. But uh, I did come home from camp feeling really confident about what I had heard super unsure how to proceed. I started by closing my photography business like I had promised I would and I made that space and then I waited. I was back to waiting. After a month of waiting, a good friend of mine lovingly yelled at me. That's how I tell the story. She told me, stop wallowing in my pity and uh, if you want a job in ministry, just go get a job in ministry. So that night, Filled with all those feelings of inadequacy again, I started looking for jobs and I came across one that caught my attention, director of kids and youth at North Park Community Church. And I thought, oh, that's strange. My parents used to go to a North Park Community Church up until my dad died. And um, it ended up being that it was the same church. They were starting a new uh, site in Stratford. I thought, okay, I'll do it. It was late. I had to fix up my resume really quickly. Um, it was the last day of the posting. So I thought like, there's probably little chance that I'm going to get this, but I'll do it. So I sent it out. Didn't even tell my husband. And um, yeah, it was a blur. Um, my hopes were not high, but all of a sudden I was in the midst of like interviews and excitement and disbelief. And, um, <laughs> on the way home from the one interview, I remember having to actually pull the car over cause I just like, I couldn't, I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't believe this was all happening. So I got the job 
And I got to be a part of the Stratford site of North Park Community Church. And I was actually sitting in the church before I realized that God had answered both of those calls that he had laid on my heart at Camp Kakwa just a month or two before. Everything had been fulfilled. And what's incredible is the people that we've been able to meet at this church and how connected we are to them in many ways and how many prayers God has answered by this new job. Jobs that were from years, jobs, prayers that were from years prior and some of them prayers that we never actually spoke. I could not have imagined something so amazing for myself. So it was hard waiting. It was hard. <laughs> it seems to be a theme in many of our lives, right? Waiting, waiting for God. But in those times of waiting, God was busy working. He wasn't waiting. He was orchestrating. He was busy orchestrating this amazing new life that he had for my family and myself. And he is busy orchestrating the same for you in those times of waiting. Last summer, I had kind of a key Bible verse, and it was Matthew 9, verse 17. And Jesus actually spoke these words. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. And you know, I feel like many of us pray for a new life. We pray for new opportunities, renewed faith, new inspiration. We ask for God to come and bring newness in us. We want that change, right? But when God agrees, we hold out our old wineskins and ask God to pour the new wine into it. We kind of wonder why it's always that same result. I know I did. Instead of trying to fit God into the way that we live and we want to live, we need to fit our lives into what God wants for us. Jesus says, new wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. If we want God's new wine, his plans, his control, all of those amazing things, and we need to let go of that old life. All those old things that are holding us back from the fullness of living with Jesus, that new wine, we have to let go of all those old ways so that God can pour that new wine into our new wineskins. Because God's way is better. God's way is better. And, and you can trust Him. You know, in, in John 10, 10, it says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy but my purpose. God's purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God wants you to have a rich and satisfying life. And you can trust Him. I did.
in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Let's pray together, church. Kind Father, you are the orchestrator, the great plan maker, the one beyond anything that we can imagine for ourselves. And God, we just want to humbly ask for you to comfort us in our waiting. Comfort us while we wait for this big plan of yours to be revealed to us. Help us to step into opportunities that you give to us. God, help us to acknowledge the clean slate. Wipe away all of the old things that are holding us back from you. Anything that might be an idol in our life. Anything, God, that separates you and us. Help us, God, to be ready for the new wine that you have in store for us. God, help us to have open hearts, open minds, open hands. Be with us this week as we make our decisions. Help us to always reflect them on you and what it is that you desire. God, we ask for you and your holy blessing in our lives so that we can in turn bless others. Amen.